As we hear God's word to us today from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, reading from the fifth chapter. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self with his passions and its desires. For if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. Let's not become arrogant, make each other angry, or be jealous of each other. Brothers and sisters, if a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual should restore someone like this with a spirit of gentleness. Watch out for yourselves so you won't be tempted too. Carry each other's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are important when they aren't, they're fooling themselves. Each person should test their own work and be happy with doing a good job and not compare themselves with others. Each person will have to carry their own load. Those who are taught the word should share all good things with their teacher. Make no mistake, God is not marked. A person will harvest what they plant. Those who plant only for their own benefit will harvest devastation from their selfishness. But those who plant for the benefit of the Spirit will harvest eternal life from the Spirit. Let's not get tired of doing good because in time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. So then, let's work for the good of all wherever we have the opportunity, and especially for those in the household of faith. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Rich Atley wrote a book entitled Sinai Summit. And in that story, he relates a story about Abraham Lincoln. When Abraham Lincoln was postmaster in a town called New Salem, Illinois. When Lincoln was postmaster, he was only 24 years of age. And he received an annual income of $55.70. The post office at New Salem, however, ended up being closed in 1836. But several years went by before a representative from Washington could arrive at that post office in order to settle all of the affairs. By that time, the ex-postmaster Lincoln was struggling to make ends meet as an attorney. The representative from Washington met with Lincoln in his office, and he audited the books. And then he turned to Lincoln and he said, Mr. Lincoln, it appears that this post office owes the government $17. Mr. Lincoln got up from his chair and walked across the room. He opened up an old trunk that was there, and he lifted out a yellow cloth that was tied with string. He took that cloth over to a table and opened it up and laid out the $17 for that federal agent. Mr. Lincoln said to the man, I never spend anyone's money but my own. After all those years, as much as Lincoln needed the money as a struggling attorney himself, he was the same person who was given the title Honest Abe as president. When I read that story, I liked what Ashley said. He asked the question, don't you wish our government officials and American citizens were as truthful and honest today as honest Abe? I think we'd all say yes to that. But the reality is, most of us doubt it'll ever happen. We think it is laughable to think of honest politicians and that's a sad commentary on our world today. 
We lament the absence of honesty, integrity, compassion, and kindness in our government officials. But we'd be wise to remember that when we point a finger of judgment at others, there are three more fingers pointing back at us. It is so easy in the world for us to get caught up in the values around us. When we purchase something, we often say, well, it was a good value for the money. But what does that mean? If it's a cheap price, it's a cheap value. We're giving up something. Many of you here may remember a poem by Edward Sanford Martin entitled, My Name is Legion. Some of you might have memorized this poem, but it has poignant lines for us to hear today. He wrote, Within my earthly temple there's a crowd, there's one of us who's humble and one of us who's proud. There's one that's brokenhearted for his sin, and there's one that's unrepentant who sits and grins. There's one that loves his neighbor as himself, and one that cares for naught but fame and self. From much corroding care, I should be free if I could once determine which one is me. It resonates with so many of us. There's a war going on between us that the Apostle Paul calls a war between the flesh and the spirit. The passage that we just read today, Paul is reminding us that if we are followers of Christ, we have died to that old way of living, that selfishness, and yet it wants to keep creeping up and taking over and battling against those values that we know are kingdom values a struggle that we all have. The Apostle Paul was honest enough to admit it to his readers in Rome when he wrote in Romans chapter 7 these words, For the good that I would do I do not, but for the evil that I would not do I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? There's always that struggle in us, and the world's values are so often not in line with God's values. Dane did an excellent job of reminding the children what values mean. Values are how we differentiate between good and bad in our community, in our culture, and in our society. They're the ideal standards for our behavior. And every day we make decisions and choices based on our values. Ultimately, our values determine our purpose in life. They determine who we'll marry and what career we'll take and what jobs we'll stay in and what relationships we will keep and sustain. Peter Gomes, in his book, The Good Life, wrote these words, The success of every culture hinges not on big points of morality but on smaller ones, like being considerate of others and pulling your own weight. These values are neither legally enforceable nor purely private, but they constitute the connective tissue between people interacting in society. The Reverend Dr. Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King gave a passionate sermon that sadly too many people have not heard. His sermon was entitled, Rediscovering Lost Values. He delivered it in Detroit in 1954. And in his message, that's so relevant for us today, he said, my friends, all I'm trying to say is that if we are to go forward today, we've got to go back. We've got to go back and rediscover some mighty precious values that we've left behind that's the only way we're going to be able to make our world a better world and to make the world what God wants it to be. And the real purpose and meaning of it, the only way we can do that is to go back and rediscover some mighty precious values that we've left behind. How do we do that? How do we rediscover the values 
that we as individuals and as a society have left behind, that no longer seem to be the standards for everybody's behavior in the world today. Well, more than likely, most of us picked up our values from the way we were raised, from the parents or the primary caregivers, our siblings, our teachers, our friends, the community that we lived in. I was reminded of that as I look at all of the children who were entrusted into our care and how they learn values by watching us more than by hearing us. The Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in virtually every letter that he wrote to remind us of what those values are that we are to live by. We recited several of them in the creed, our social creed that we read together today. And yet we learn more by watching how other people live. There was a poem that was written many years ago entitled, Children Learn What They Live. If children learn to live, if children live with criticism, they learn to condemn. If children live with hostility, they learn to fight. If children live with ridicule, they learn to be shy. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If they live with tolerance, they learn patience. If they live with praise, they learn to appreciate. If they live with acceptance, they learn to love. If they live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If they live with honesty, they learn truthfulness. If they live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves and others. If they live with friendliness, they learn that the world is a nice place in which to live. Children, and I dare say all of us, learn by watching others. It's important who we hang around with and who we watch, for we learn and we pick up things, whether we want to or not. That's why the community of faith is so important, to gather together with others who share similar values with us. One of my husband Richard's favorite stories that brings this lesson home is a story that reminds us that we all have a responsibility to live by the values that God calls us to live by, the values that the Apostle Paul outlines for us in the passage that we read today, values that seek to build others up and bear each other's burdens. The story is entitled, The Christmas Rifle, and I want to share it with you today in the writer's own words. It comes from a man named Matt who was reminiscing about Christmas long ago. Listen as I tell you his story. He writes, My pa never had much compassion for the lazy or for those who squandered their means. And he never thought much of people who just didn't do for themselves. But for those who were genuinely in need, his heart was as big as all outdoors. It was Christmas Eve in 1881 when I remember Paul taught me the importance of values. I was 15 years old and I was feeling like the world had caved in on me because my parents just didn't have enough money to buy for me that hunting rifle that I wanted so badly for Christmas. We did our chores early that day for some reason, and I just figured Pa wanted to spend a little bit more time reading the Bible to us since it was Christmas Eve. After supper, I took off my boots and I stretched out in front of the fireplace waiting for Pa to take down the family Bible and start his reading. But that's not what Pa did. Instead, he put his coat back on, 
and his boots back on, and he headed out the door. For the life of me, I couldn't understand why Paul was doing that. All the chores had been finished. I didn't worry about it long, though, because I was too busy wallowing in my own self-pity. But soon Paul came back into the house. It was cold out there, cold as ice. Come on, Matt, he said, bundle up good, because it is cold out there tonight. Now, I was really upset then. What did Paul want me to do outside? We'd already finished all of our chores. I knew we had. There was no earthly reason I could see why I needed to bundle up and go outside in the cold. But I knew Paul was not a very patient man with people dragging their feet. So I did what he told me to do. I got up, put on my cap, my coat, and my mittens. My ma gave me a mysterious smile as I walked past her, so I knew something was up, but I didn't know what. Outside, I became even more dismayed because in front of the house were the workhorses, and already they were hitched up to the big sled. Whatever it was we were going to do, it was not going to be quick, and it was not going to be easy. I could tell because we never hitched up the big sled unless it was a big job we were going to do. Pa was up on the seat, the reins were in his hand, and I reluctantly climbed up beside him. The cold was already biting at me, and I was not happy at all. When I was on, Paul pulled the sled around to the back of the house, and he stopped in front of the woodshed. He got off, and I followed him. I think we'll put up the high sideboards, Paul said. The high sideboards? I didn't want to work on anything that would even call for the low sideboards. If he wanted the high sideboards, how much work did Paul want me to do? After we exchanged those sideboards, though, I followed Paul into the woodshed. Paul lifted up an armload of wood, wood that I had spent all summer hauling down from the mountain and all fall sawing and splitting into blocks. What was he doing? So I asked him, Paul, what's this all about? Paul said, you been by the Widow Jensen's house lately? Well, sure I'd been by Widow Jensen's house she just lived three miles down the road from us. Her husband had died a year or so before and left her with three children, the oldest being about eight years old. So I told him, yeah, I've been by, why? Pa said, well, I just rode by there today. And little Jakey was out there digging around in their wood pile trying to find a few chips. They're out of wood, Matt. And that was all he said. He turned around and he lifted up another load of wood. So I followed him. We loaded that sled so high that I began to wonder if the horses would be able to carry it. Finally, Paul called a halt. And he drove the sled around to the smokehouse where he took out a big ham and a side of bacon. He handed those to me and told me to put them in the sled. And then he returned and got a sack of flour and a smaller sack of something. What's in that little sack, I asked. Shoes, he said. They're out of shoes. Little Jakey just had gunny sacks wrapped around his feet when he was out there digging in that woodshed in this cold. So I picked up some shoes for them, and I got them a little bit of Christmas candy, because it just wouldn't be Christmas without some candy. Well, we rode in silence those three miles to Widow Jensen's house. I tried to think through what Paul was doing. Because we didn't have a lot by worldly standards. Of course, we did have that big wood pile, most of which was still left to be split by me. And we also had meat and flour, so we could spare some of that. But I knew we didn't have much money. So why was Paul spending money buying shoes for Widow Jensen and her family. And why was he buying them candy? Really, why was he doing any of this? There were other neighbors who lived closer to them. Why was it any of our business? 
Well, we came around the blind side of the Jensen's house and we unloaded the wood as quietly as possible. And then we took the meat and the flour and the sack of shoes to the front door and knocked on the door. There was a little crack in the door and a timid voice said, Who is it? My dad said, Lucas Miles, ma'am, and my son Matt. Can we come in for a bit? Widow Jensen opened the door and she let us in. She had a blanket that was wrapped around her shoulders and all three of her children were huddled around a measly little fire with another blanket wrapped around them. That fire was so small it hardly gave off any heat. Widow Jensen fumbled with a match and lit a little lamp so we could see. We brought you a few things, ma'am, Pa said, and he set the flour and the meat on the table. Then Pa handed her the sack with the shoes in it, and she opened it hesitantly. When she saw those shoes, she took them out one pair at a time. There was one for each of the three children and a pair for her. Sturdy shoes, I noticed. The best shoes, shoes that would last. I watched her carefully, and she bit her lower lip. Tears started streaming down her cheeks, and a smile went across her face, a smile that she had probably not smiled in years. She looked at Pa like she wanted to say something, but no words would come out. So Pa said, well, we brought you some wood too, ma'am. And he looked at me and he said, Matt, you go out and get a load of wood and you bring it. Let's see if we can build that fire up and warm this place up. Well, I'm here to tell you I wasn't the same person when I went back out. I had a big lump in my throat, and as much as I hate to admit it, I had tears in my eyes too. And in my mind, I kept seeing those kids huddled around that fireplace and their mother sitting there with those tears running down her cheek and her heart so full of gratitude that she couldn't hardly speak. My heart swelled within me, and a joy filled me. It filled my soul so full. Now, I'd given things to people at Christmas many times before, but never had it made such a difference. I realized we were literally saving the lives of these people. I soon had that fire blazing, and our spirits were soaring, and the kids started giggling as Pa handed each one of them a piece of candy. And the widow Jensen looked on with a smile, and she turned to us and she said, God bless you. I know the Lord has sent you. My children and I were just here praying tonight that the Lord would send us an angel to help us and to spare us. Well, I never thought of Pa in those exact terms. But when she said that, I realized it probably was true. I started remembering all the times that Pa and Ma had gone out of their way for me and many others and it seemed endless as I thought about it. Before we left, Ta Pa took the kids in his arms and he gave each one of them a hug and they clung to him like they didn't want to let him go. And it was clear to me that they were really missing their Pa that night. And I was so glad I still had mine. At the door, Pa turned to Widow Jensen and said, the missus wanted me to invite you and the children to come over to Marty eat Christmas dinner with us. That turkey's going to be bigger than just the three of us can eat, and it'll be good to have little kids around. Matt here hadn't been little in quite a while. Widow Jensen nodded and said, Oh, thank you very much. May God bless you, and I know God certainly will. Well, out on the sled, I felt a warmth that I hadn't felt ever, really. I didn't even notice the cold anymore. When we had gone a ways, Pa turned to me and he said, Matt, I want you to know something. Your Ma and me had been tucking a little bit of money away here and there all year because we wanted to buy you that Christmas rifle for hunting. We knew you wanted it. And we knew we live on hunting so much. But we didn't have quite enough money. Until the other day, a man came by the house, a man who owed me some money, and he decided it was time to settle up, so he gave me that extra money. And your ma and I, we were so excited, now we had enough money we could go buy you that rifle. We were going to surprise you. But as I drove into town, I noticed little Jakey at that woodpile, and I noticed those gunny sacks around his feet. 
and I knew what I had to do. So I spent that money buying those shoes for the Jensen's. I hope you understand. Oh, yes, Pa, I understand. I understand fully. My Pa helped me to set priorities straight. My Pa made me realize that that rifle needed to be very low on my list of priorities, for he had given me more than I had ever received at any Christmas. He'd given me the look on Widow Jensen's face and the smiles and the laughter in those children's hearts. And for the rest of my life, whenever I saw the Jensen's or split a block of wood, I couldn't help but remember back to that same joy that I felt riding home that night with Pa, reminding me what Christ came to show us, what Christ came to teach us, what the Apostle Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit at work in our life, things like love and joy and peace, kindness and generosity, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. I learned those values from my pa, and I hope others will learn them from me. My dear friends, May we each have the faith and the courage to so live so that others will see kingdom values in our lives, both now and forever. Amen.